Hello from ITU Telecom World, which is taking place here in Geneva, Switzerland, and I'm talking with Jaya Ballou, who is with Verizon, and she works in a very interesting area concerned with privacy, coding, lawful intercept, and so on. Jaya, welcome. We talked two years ago at another ITU event about lawful intercept and had a very um, energized debate, shall we put it like that. And now you've moved on. You're still, you're still involved in lawful intercept, but you're looking now at um, identity assurance and so on. Let's begin at the beginning. These days, just about everybody will have at least one password for electronic communication of one sort or another. Many will have 10, 12, some will have hundreds. They're becoming unmanageable. Are there any solutions to that that are safe for the users? There's actually a lot of solutions to this and uh, Verizon uh, is quite innovative in terms of what we can provide here, but we are not alone. The entire market is trending towards something that's called uh, multiple factor strong authentication, where we uh, not just give you uh, a username and password, it's beyond that, but it's about credentials that inform, uh, have more than one form factor. So it means that it's something you have, it's something you know it's also a bit of something you are but it's also your behavior so something you've done um, so there are a lot of different factors that we can use to provide you with credentials that are cool cheap and when I say we I, I mean Verizon but also the rest of the industry there's a lot happening out there and very very safe and I think that's the cornerstone it has to be secure because of the kind of transactions that are being used for or with these credentials Given that, what's wrong with the current solutions? Why try to find something else? Is it any more secure? In the news recently, there's been quite a few companies, uh, even in the last few months, uh, different uh, providers of strong authentication solutions, as well as certificate authorities, which we rely on to trust a particular site, uh, that have all suffered major, major attacks. Um, and you know th there are there's a lot to be said here because these are security minded companies that are facing attacks so there are security breaches but what I think that uh, current systems are uh, not doing today is providing you with something that uh, the current development the innovation is able to provide you which is something we call an ID risk score so like everything, um, it's all relevant and relative to what you're trying to do. So it's a contextual based for looking at, okay, so if you want to log into your email, then maybe you do only need your username and password. But if you want to buy uh, a couple of books, then you need maybe a stronger credential. And finally, if you uh, want to change your billing address or your shipping address, then you might need to supply even more information. So it's taking that all together and making it very, very easy to use because that's not there now and that's what needs to come. So are you saying that the solutions are completely safe? I think you know we're in a process of learning and um, I think that we all build on uh, just as much on the mistakes of the of previous uh, predecessors is on their successes. So I think this is yet another phase in our evolution. I'm not saying it's the last one, so I'm not saying it's the perfect solution, but what Verizon's uh, Universal Identity Services is trying to do is create that solution that's really focused on what the user uh, needs and what the user uh, will have the greatest ease in, in implementing and, and using for a long uh, period of time, hopefully. Aren't we in danger of using a sledgehammer to crack a nut here? Most of the world's population are honest. Are we not putting the rights of most of the world's population at risk by trying to catch a few people who are criminals by using this panoply of electronic surveillance and ID management. You're right. I mean, of course, the bigger the thing, the more interesting it is also for cyber criminals to attack a single scheme. So it's not really about a, a mass ID. It's about uh, contextual identification. Um, and what I think the, the thing that we're trying to fix is there's a gap. There's a gap in the market, you know, that, um, and you're just trying to make sure that users feel comfortable about having online transactions with a higher degree of assurance and that the people who, who rely on those transactions in order to get their money at the end of the day really trust their users. So it's really a sort of mutual authentication and in the middle what you know Verizon is hoping to do along with other players is to be um, an ID broker, an identity broker and we don't have to be the only one and the, there are certainly lots of parties that are at stake so it's not a mass 
a system that's doing this for everyone, but it's certainly one of the options. So I take it, Jaya, there's a difference in approach between the individual user and the enterprise. Absolutely. And I think the primarily, primary difference is that uh, from an enterprise perspective, um, it's a question of enrollment. You know, um, an enterprise can decide and tell us uh, who their users are. They know who their users are, they know about their behavior, and they also know what services uh, and resources their users have access to, the enterprise model. However, in a user model, that can differ, and it can be highly flexible, extensible, um, and it should be up to the user to tell us, uh, who do I want to trust, and how much do I trust them? So what information do I want uh, an Amazon or a Google or a, a whomever uh, to know about me? My point is that if this goes ahead, it's got to be user-centric, it's got to be voluntary, and it's got to be policed and verifiable. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And, and the to the reference to the third point, policed and verified, I think there's, you still have to protect the user. It's, it's everybody's responsibility to protect the user. Um, and it's the user's responsibility to tell us how they would like the system to be and how, what kind of trust levels there, are, there should be built in uh, to the people that they interact with. So I, I really think that the, the biggest protection of the user is also to be able to identify those users that aren't abiding by those rules, that are a potential threat. So you still have to be able to catch the bad guys, and these systems should enable it, but there should be a separation of power so that not all of the information is residing in any single place. And that is the ultimate uh, pure form of, of such a, a properly set up identity management system. I think many journalists, as well as many other people, would be very suspicious of the notion of the equivalent of ID cards for everyone. In the UK, the last government, the Labour government, fell partially because of its support for an ID card system that very few people actually wanted. And that has now gone away, thankfully. But are we not in danger of doing the same thing with electronic ID as we did with papers, with licenses, and so on? I, I see this slightly differently. I, I think that you know public-private partnerships are necessary, so this collaboration is necessary. But I think that when you look at private, it's not a single private company solely working with a single government. When you look at the market, the global market, and these kinds of solutions, it's usually collaboration. It has to be. So there's usually some sort of consortium model of several people that are together. And you know, if you look at the technology that's underlying these authentication systems, usually I. The, all the identity broker has to do, the guy sitting in the middle that knows who this person is, the user, and this person is the you know, enterprise that wants to make use or sell something to that user. The way that that works is that there's a, a request and a reply to both sides. And it's a SAML request and a SAML assertion. And if that is just there, that's all that's required. So they don't need to know the full-fledged details of everything that's happening and keep all of it. It's just, is that OK? Yes, no. And that's pretty much done on both sides. So it's not uh, technology, thankfully, here has brought a lot of solutions that are really coming from the overall uh, standards and processes that are st actually still in development. Because let's be honest, there's been a lot of different schemes as well for identity in terms of what kind of standards will be used. There's Oasis, Liberty Alliance, OpenID. Uh, recently, they stopped with Microsoft Card Space. So there's a lot of work. There's still, I, I still don't know if we're at the final iterations in terms of standards. But the only solution that I see, while we're still waiting for that to happen, is to have a system, which is what we're trying to do, which says, OK, we get it. There's a lot of standards. So that means we have to be compliant to all of those open standards. We can't willy-nilly just choose one and say, that's the dart that we're going to throw and aim for. Because I don't think that serves our users. I don't think that serves anyone, actually. And at the end of the day, it creates yet another problem, because then you need to have, again, yet another system to do this open standard and yet another, that's, that's only increasing the complexity. We're trying to make it easy, cheap, and cool. So what you're saying is what you said in your presentation, basically, that we all have rights to privacy, but nobody has rights to secrecy. Well, maybe some people do. 
Yeah, I think that's an inflammatory comment that I actually, by the way, I said that at my panel to, uh, to get my, the rest of my panel talking. So uh, it's pu purely inflammatory, and I, I fully uh, see why it should be said. So the idea is um, if you say, and I do believe this, everyone does have a right to be anonymous. They have a right to that anonymity. But secrecy implies that the purpose of that anonymity is to do something, actually, that they don't want anyone knowing about because potentially there's some great harm uh, that they're trying to perpetrate. And I think that is really the balance. So trying to find the balance with allowing people to not have to divulge so many details about their identity and carry uh, about doing what they're doing as long as they're not doing any harm. And I think when they are doing harm, when there are issues of child uh, pornography uh, or a fraud, uh, however that fraud is, I think there are very legitimate reasons to be able to take away a, a right, in essence, of that person in order to meet a responsibility towards your citizens. Jaya Balu, great stuff as usual. Thanks very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.